All right. What do we want to do here in the time we have left? So, could you see what chapters those were again? I don't want you to quote me because I don't have the book in front of me, but I believe it's the first three chapters and then maybe chapter nine, whatever the last chapter is that talks about half adders, full adders. Oh, that makes sense. ALUs. Yeah. Is that right? Because <coughs> I think that actually that was why I was wondering if I couldn't find, I was like searching for chapters. Yeah, it's stuck at the back of the book. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Why? 23 did just half half the adders. Yeah. So let me talk about one thing and defer on something and then talk about something else. Um, let me talk about compressed truth tables. No, you know what? I'm not going to talk about that. Heck with them. We'll come back to them at the end of the course. We're not going to use them for anything, really. Um, I won't put them on the midterm but we usually have a little bit of time left over at the end of the term, so we'll come back and talk about them. It's a way to write a truth table with fewer variables in the inputs. Yeah? Um, I did have a question on the lab. Okay. Um, on experiment 1A, one, one oh. it mm -hmm. says anode pins number 13 and 14. So Should be 3 and 14, and yeah, typo, good. <coughs> Let's take a look at component specifications. <laughs> so there's a thing, it's, it's labeled eight to three encoder. It's actually what we call a three line eight line to three line priority encoder. And I just want to mention this as another example of one of these larger scale chips that we'll encounter sometimes, kind of like multiplexers, demultiplexers, uh, the 7447 for driving that seven segment display. This is a different type of chip. It's called a priority encoder. And it's useful for building computers and doing other things like that. And I just want to touch on what this thing does. So here's a truth table for it. It's got nine inputs and four outputs. And I want you to think about switching the H's and L's. So everywhere you see an H, think of an L, and everywhere you see an L, think of an H. On both sides? On the inputs and the outputs. And don't worry about this stuff over here. <laughs> Separate table. All right. And if we think of, of that first row as where all the inputs are zero, all of the outputs are also zero. Okay, that's an uninteresting row. But this second row is saying, suppose that input nine is high. Doesn't matter what any of the other inputs are. What is our output going to be? It's gonna be one, zero, zero, one. That's the number nine. Okay, hold that thought. Suppose that input 9 is low, but input 8 is high. Our output is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0. That's an 8. And it doesn't matter what any of these inputs are. So if input 9 is high, this circuit outputs the number 9. If 9 is low, but 8 is high, this outputs the number 8. If 9 and 8 are low, but 7 is high, this will output the number 7. So in words, what is this thing outputting? 
What's the pattern here? The highest number that's got a 1 coming into it. So priority encoder is a circuit that you use when you have multiple things that are generating signals, and each of them has a different priority level, a different degree of your interest in it. And you want to know what's the highest priority input that's got a 1 coming in. You can take your inputs, you can feed them into this priority encoder, and the outputs will tell you the number of the input that you're interested in. And it's no harder to build this than any other circuit. We have a truth table for it. There's lots of don't cares in the inputs. We'd need to actually fill those out. And again, we'd have 512 rows in our truth table because there's nine inputs. But in each case, there's four outputs we can do with sum of products and minimize and so on. But what is this useful for? Well, imagine you have a computer. So here's a CPU. And computers can get interrupted, just like people. Things happen, and you can set things up so when something happens, you get the CPU's attention, and it starts running some piece of code to respond to, to this event. So what kinds of things might trigger the CPU's attention? Well, there could be something happening on a keyboard. Somebody hit a key. Okay. There could be something coming in from the internet. There could be a power failure. Could be a virus. Although we don't detect those in the hardware yet, we should. So there's, there's three events that might happen. And the reason that these would be interesting is because they're not part of the program that's running in the CPU. They're events that are happening outside the system. So your CPU is doing its thing. It's displaying you know, what's coming out of a projector in a classroom, but all of a sudden I hit something on the keyboard and the CPU needs to know that so it can do something different now, right? Or a network packet comes in and it's the start of a piece of email and my mail client has to run and take that in and save it to disk and put up a notice saying you've got mail. Or the power is going down and something's got to happen. We got to save critical information on disk before the CPU shuts down. So all three of these things are things that will interrupt the CPU, but they have different priority levels. If somebody hits a key, they're probably not going to hit another key for, I don't know, a thirtieth of a second, a tenth of a second, depends how fast they're typing, forever, right, in terms of a computer. Something comes in from the internet, well, you probably want to respond to that pretty quickly because internet traffic can be fairly quick, right? Power fail happens, stop everything. Let's get that critical data from memory, write it out to disk, and shut down the CPU in an orderly way so we don't corrupt any files. So these things could go into a priority encoder. And we could take these and we could OR them and use this to say, interrupt the CPU. So if any of those happen, the CPU gets an interrupt and says, hey, I got to take care of something. What do I have to take care of? Well, if we were to look at the outputs from this priority encoder, it can read these outputs and it will tell it what the highest priority event is that it needs to take care of. So we would put this in on line nine, maybe we would put this in on line four, and we put this in on line one. And so it reads these values, and if it sees the number one, it knows there's nothing happening here, there's nothing happening here, there's a keyboard press. Okay, I'll get back to that later. But if it reads these and it sees the number nine, whoa, power's going down. I gotta stop what I'm doing and go deal with that. So use a priority encoder to allow a system to easily figure out what the highest level event is that's occurring, for example. And it's just a circuit. Um, it looks like this. They all kind of look the same after a while. <laughs> it's a bunch of gates. Um, so that's, that's an encoder. And there's, there's lots of different kinds of encoders and decoders. Um, 
So that's one you may encounter again. All right. So let's finish up talking about programmable logic. So pals that we started talking about on Tuesday. And then after this, you'll be able to do those last two homework assignments. So remember the idea of a PAL was you had inputs. And then we had AND gates over here. And we drew these things like this. And we could specify which of our inputs, true or inverted, we wanted fed into our AND gate. And we drew a symbol like this to signify a connection. So with these symbols drawn, the output of this AND gate would be A bar ended with B. And with these symbols drawn, the output here might be B bar ended with C bar. So everything that didn't have an X is just supposed to melt and yes. fuse? Yes. So anything without an X, that fuse will get blown and it'll be disconnected. Okay. And so the X's actually indicate intact fuses. And then these could get ORed together. So we can program this to implement some function. Well, a more useful version of this is something called a PLA, Programmable Logic Array. And this part looks exactly the same, but now we also have a series of lines like this going into OR gates. And we have another plane of fuses, and we can choose which of these we want to OR together. So you have more AND gates. And this is in some sense much more general, right? Because we can specify what min terms we want by choosing different inputs to be ANDed together. And then we can choose which of those products we want to sum together by making or breaking connections in this plane of fuses. Is the k-map necessary to reduce these to min terms, or nope. are they already kind of reduced? To there are this, you can really do this from a truth table, right? And when you use a programmer, you put in something like a truth table, typically, and it goes directly into this. And there's no need to simplify. And in fact, there's no way to simplify. Well, there is in some cases. Um, but there's no need to unless maybe there's a speed issue or something to having fewer terms. But yeah, you can get this directly out of the truth table. So this area over here, this is called the AND plane. And this area over here is the OR plane. And so there's, there's at least two different kinds of programmable devices. So a PAL, the AND plane, is programmable. The OR plane is fixed. So that first drawing where you take the outputs of these AND gates and just run them through an OR gate, right? That's an example of a PAL. That's what we talked about on Tuesday. But the more general version of the PLA, the AND gate plane is programmable, and the OR plane is also programmable.
So here's a data sheet for a PAL. It's a 20 pin package, ground and power. And it's got a bunch of inputs on the left. It's got a bunch of lines on the right that can be inputs or outputs. Very simple system diagram view, right? But what's inside is a circuit with a programmable AND plane. And it looks something like this. So this is a, a stylized picture of the AND planes fuse map, okay, using the single lines going into the AND gates and so on. But basically, we have an input here, and the true input runs along this line, zero. The inverted input runs along this next line, one. Here's another input. This is pin three of the chip. The true value runs along this line, four. The inverted value runs along five. And by connecting any of these lines to these horizontal lines, we can feed the inputs of these AND gates. And the outputs of all of these AND gates get ORed together by this big OR gate. And the output of that gets inverted. And that goes to the output. And there's an input going into the side of this. That's another enable input. We can drive this low to actually disable this inverter. And it causes the output to effectively float. It doesn't make it high, it doesn't make it low, it actually disconnects it electrically. So we can control this AND plane completely, choose which terms are ANDed together, but all of these get ORed together, all of these get ORed together, and so on. So this is a PAL, fixed OR plane, programmable AND plane. And you have a total of um, 2,048, I believe, connections that you have to specify. Do you want this made or not made? So we don't do this by hand. Right? You use equations or a truth table or some piece of software, and it'll generate the ones and zeros you want here and send it into a programmer, which actually makes or breaks these connections. And then you remove the chip from the programmer, and you've got a 20-pin chip, and it's been programmed to do whatever mapping from inputs to outputs all of this specifies. And the increment is the order in which you specify each of these connection points. So it starts with this one, goes all the way over to this one, then comes down to the next row, and continues all the way through. And these are cheap, right? It's a couple of bucks, I think, to get one of these. And they come in all kinds of different flavors and packages and things like that. All right, so we got a PAL, programmable AND plane. We've got a PLA, programmable AND plane, and a programmable OR plane. There's one more version of this. What's the other variant that's missing here? We've got programmable fixed, programmable programmable. Double extensed. Yeah. The AND plane could be fixed, and the OR plane could be programmable. They could both be fixed, but that's not a programmable logic device. <laughs> that's just a logic device. But the AND plane could be fixed, and the OR plane could be programmable. And what does that look like? Let me do a three variable version of this. Well, if we're not going to let the user make or break connections over here, we better make sure we've got all possible combinations of connections that the user might want. 
in the and plane. So let's make some combinations. So here's one. Here's another. And that's all you need. Can we kind of use these, how we use the NOR gates, and just, if we only have one kind, use a bunch of them to mm -hmm. do and undo things? You can implement any logic function you want with these things. It's, it's better than a NOR gate, <coughs> right? It's more straightforward to use. And yeah, if you can write equations for it or you can write a truth table for it, you can set up your fuse connections on any of these programmable devices and implement that logic with just this one piece of hardware. So we saw how to use a multiplexer to implement a truth table pretty painlessly. This is another way. Right? Get a programmable device, program the fuse map or fuse maps accordingly good to go. All right, so what have we marked in here? Remember, this is not programmable by the user. Okay, this is how it comes from the factory. So we could have drawn big dots. And why have I chosen the dots in this particular way? Zero through ten. Yeah, it was zero through seven. But this line basically corresponds to min term zero. If A is zero and B is zero and C is zero, this line's going to have a one, or rather the three lines coming across here are all gonna be one. If my input is zero, zero, one, which is min term one, this line will be asserted. So I'm basically generating all of my min terms in this fixed function and plane. Now the OR plane is programmable. So here's where the user can actually specify fuses. So let's call this x0, x1, x2, x3. And let's make a truth table. So we've got three inputs, A, B, C. We've got four outputs. All right, what function should we implement? Um, Let's make x3 an AND gate. So it should be one when all three inputs are one and zero everywhere else. Let's make x2 that sum bit from our full adder. If you remember that or recognize it, the truth table looked like this. Okay, I had that dual between the top and the bottom. What should we make x1? Shout out your favorite bits, ones or zeros. <laughs> one. Zero. One. Zero. Twelve. One. <coughs> and one. Okay, good. There's x1. And x0, let's, uh, let's make this an OR gauge. All right, so we got four really important functions that we want to implement using this programmable device. Well, x0 should be a one in any of these last seven input combinations. So I just make a connection right there. That's our x0. 
If our input is 0, 0, 0, this line will be a 0. This line will be a 1. All the other lines will be 0 going into our OR gate. The output will be 0. M1, our favorite function. I can make the fuse map for that. It's a 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. X2 is our sum bit. Looks like that. And X3 is our AND gate. And there we go. We're done. So what have we done here? I can't fit both of these. But this OR plane being programmed this way corresponds precisely to this truth table. Is the X2 different? I think it might be different. Zero, one, one, zero. Thank you. Okay, now it's the same. Thanks. So this OR plane, if we program it with this particular set of connections, we've implemented this truth table. And certainly, if we have a different truth table, we could have different connections here, and we would have that truth table implemented. And we don't do anything over here in the AND plane, right? We're just making connections in the OR plane. Good with that so far? So I haven't told you what this kind of device is called. Over here. This is called a prom. So, who's heard of a prom? Who's heard of a ROM? So, what's a ROM? An illegal old game? <laughs> Usually. <coughs> so, a ROM is a read only memory, it's a piece of hardware that stores a bunch of ones and zeros. And you can't modify it. It's read only. So old games were usually the hardware was a ROM, and it had the code for the game in it. A PROM is a programmable read only memory. So it's read only, but yeah, you can also program it. <laughs> but it's not very convenient to program. So it's primarily read only. And the reason it's inconvenient of a prom. Here we go. <laughs> this is sweet because AC Delco is selling proms. <laughs> right? AC Delco is a car company. Yeah. Right? So why are they selling proms? <laughs> so so these are all programmable read only memories, but a lot of them they have this little window on the top. It's made out of quartz. And if you look through that window, you actually see something that looks like a chip inside with all these little wires coming off of it. That's the actual circuitry. And the early technology for this, remember, if you blow fuses, it's a one-time operation. But an early technology for this used physical properties so that if you took your circuitry and exposed it to ultraviolet light, it would reset all the connections. And it took about 30 minutes to do that. But you could do it. And so you would take your chip and you throw it inside. Wrong kind of prom there. There you go. You throw it inside this device, right? So you put it in here and you slide this in and you say start and there's a timer. And after 20 or 30 minutes, you pull those out, and they've been erased, and you can reprogram them now. Right? So not, not very reprogrammable, but you could do it. And the idea was, let's say you made a video game, right? And you put this in arcades, and now you have a new version of the game because there was a glitch you wanted to correct. You could take these chips, and you could put them in here, erase them, put them in your programmer, load the new program in, pop it back into the game. So you can do field upgrades. So they're basically memories. They're ways to store files, if you like, collections of ones and zeros. 
And you can see that if you go back to this circuit, we could think of this as a chip that holds eight four-bit numbers. And what are the four bits that it's holding? Well, this four-bit number, this four-bit number, and so on. So think of an array. How many people have done 121? CSE 121. So, so think of a computer, and we have some sort of variable or memory, and this memory stores eight numbers for us, right? So we've got number zero, number one, number two, and so on, all the way up to number seven. And our first number is zero, zero, one, zero, which is the number two. Our second number is 0101, which is the number 5. Our third number is 0011, which is 3, and so on. And our last number is 1111, which is 15. This is just a bunch of data. It's a piece of hardware that's storing 8 4-bit numbers, 8 integers, from 0 to 15. That's what a memory does. A memory is a block of hardware. You have different locations. You can store things, and you can say, tell me what's at location 3. And it'll say, oh, that contains a 0011, which is the number 3. Tell me what's at location 4. Oh, that's a 0101, which is the number 5. It's a lookup table. So that's the naming of a PROM programmable read-only memory. Um, it's the memory part. Okay, so this should be starting to disturb you. If it doesn't now, it will later. Because we were talking about <coughs> implementing logic circuits, making a circuit that generates the sum bit for a full adder, or implementing an AND gate, or an OR gate. But now we're talking about just storing a bunch of numbers in a memory but we're still talking about the same hardware. So which is it? Are we talking about digital circuits or are we talking about storing a bunch of data in a memory somewhere? Or are they the same thing? Same thing. Kind of starting to look like maybe they're the same thing in some weird twisted way, right? Because if you give me a bunch of data, I can program the OR plane of a PROM and store that data, 2, 5, 5, 3, 5, and so on. But I can blink my eyes and now take the same PROM and plug it into a protoboard and feed in A, B, and carry in, get my sum bit out right here. And I could have a carry out bit here. And it's suddenly a full adder. So what's this connection between digital logic and data. So how do you learn to add numbers in grade school? Practice. Practice. Memorization. Right? Is there any real reason why 7 plus 8 is 15? Well, we can do it on our fingers if we're real quick. But the reason 7 and 8 is 15 is because there was this addition table on the wall and if you went over to 7 and you went down to 8, there was a 15 written there, right? And we memorized that. But this operation of addition was stored in this memory, this table, that we could look at and just read out at this position. There's the answer for 7 plus 8. And we've already done that in our current lab. We made a truth table to do addition, right? put in three bits, A, B, and a carry in, and we get out a two-bit answer, a sum and a carry out. And we didn't teach our circuit how to add numbers, we just made a lookup table. So, how far can we push this? Suppose you wanted to be able to add 10-bit numbers. We started this whole thing off a weekish ago by saying we could make a truth table. 
with 10 columns for A and 10 columns for B and 21 columns of output. And by just filling in those ones and zeros correctly, you give me your two numbers A and B, I just find the right row, there's your sum. No logic, no XORs, no full adder, half adder, it's just a lookup operation. Can we do that for multiplication? Why not? Do it for division, subtraction. Could we do it for all four? Could we have a big lookup table that lets us add, subtract, multiply, and divide 10 bit numbers? 10 bits for A, 10 bits for B, two bits to say what operation you want to do add, subtract, multiply, or divide. Now we got 22 inputs instead of 20. A few more rows in the truth table, but we still put all the answers over here in the output fields. And it's just a big lookup table. Can we play chess like this? Anyone play chess? I don't play chess. I know how to, but I don't, I'm not good at it. <coughs> So, so what's, what's a game of chess? Your opponent makes a move, you make a move, your opponent makes a move, you make a move. Okay, we'll let your opponent go first. What if we made a really big book and we listed every possible first move your opponent would make? And it said, if your opponent makes this move, go to page 740. Mm -hmm. And at the top of page 740, it would say, here's the move you should make. And then there was a table of contents there that said, if your opponent makes this move next, go to page 12 million and six. And on that page, you'd see what your next move should be, and then a list of all the moves your opponent might make and where to go for that. And you could make a book that covers all possible chess games, up to, you know, say 100 moves or some fixed number of moves. It'd be a huge book. But if you coded this with full knowledge of like the best possible way to respond to every move, you could make a game that would beat any or tie any opponent ever. And it's just a big encyclopedia, it's just a big lookup table. It's effectively a truth table with more than ones and zeros. And there's no logic, there's no neural network, there's no XOR gates, none of that stuff. It's just data. What is that like compared to like AR? kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. So real AI, or let's just talk about AI, just about intelligence. Um, that's not how we work, right, presumably. We don't, we don't have um, in our heads a table that says 17 plus 33 is equal to 50, right? We see a 17 and a 33. And we know 7 and 3 is 10, but then we do this kind of thing, and 1 and 1 and 3 is 5, right? Um, so we're a little slower at this, maybe, but it also lets us define abstract notions like addition and mathematics and physics and computer science and philosophy and all this, and you don't get that, presumably, with this big book of knowledge kind of approach. But functionally, if that's your only goal is to play chess or to add, subtract, multiply, and divide 10 digit numbers or whatever, right? functionally you can get there either way. And that should be a little disturbing maybe, should be a little comforting maybe, <laughs> but it's something to think about. Um, because at some level it's all kind of the same and that is kind of where my research began 35 years ago, sort of with these kinds of notions of, of data versus code, and when is code actually data, and when is data actually code, and when is hardware actually just numbers, and vice versa. Um, and it can take you a lot of places. So proms are one of those areas where we, we sort of have to confront this a little bit, but for the most part, we kind of ignore it. If we're doing digital logic, then we're doing circuits and stuff, and if we're doing something else, we're doing lookup tables. But it's a cool thing to ponder on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> All right, so any other comments, questions? Chris, the PLA list. 
Uh, the which? Just the four different types. Oh, um, yes. All right, so we're going to massively change gears on Tuesday. And we're going to start working with fundamentally different kinds of circuits. Every circuit we've dealt with so far, if you look at the inputs, you can tell what the outputs are. And Tuesday, we're going to look at circuits that have a notion of state, where there's something about what's going on inside the circuit that might affect its behavior. So just knowing the inputs won't tell us the outputs. We need to know the inputs, but also what the internal state of the system is. And I'll give you something to think about between now and then. Two circuits. Here's one circuit. It's a pair of inverters connected like this. What's the value of x? Here's another circuit. What's the value of x? So that's where we'll start on Tuesday. All right, so I will see you then.